Thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're going to be discussing sexual citizens, a landmark study of sex, power and assault on campus. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity to have an honest conversation about sexual assault on campus. Um, this book has been published by W. W. Norton. Uh, you can pre-order it uh, in paperback in the UK from the 26th of February. That's when it's coming out, so pre-order it now. Um, I have just a couple of housekeeping matters before I go over to the introductions. This session is being recorded, providing that your microphone isn't on, you won't be in the recording. So it doesn't matter if your video is on, uh, you won't be shown in the recording. So I am uh, Dr. Charlotte Proudman. I am a uh, junior research fellow at Queen's College in Cambridge and also in the Department of Sociology. And it brings me great pleasure to introduce to you today um, our speakers. Uh, who are the acclaimed authors of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power and assault on campus. We have Professor Jennifer Hirsch, who is a professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. And we also have Professor Seamus Khan, who is a professor of sociology at Columbia. And they are both co-authors of the book that we are going to be discussing in some detail today. Now, the work um, was realized within this book as part of Columbia's sexual health initiative to foster transformation or shift. We're gonna be speaking a little bit more about what that means in due course. And it was co-directed by Jennifer and clinical psychologist Claude uh, Anne Mellons, uh, which was profiled in the New Yorker in February of 2018. And a recent review in Science describes sexual citizens as, quote, profoundly eye opening. And that's certainly a statement that I can agree with. It's uh, certainly a profound, groundbreaking book, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about now. And so we're delighted to welcome Jennifer and Seamus to speak with us at the Department of Sociology, our public seminar. There is some content warning for you all, and I want you to know that before we begin, it's important to know, as I said at the outset, this will be an honest discussion um, of sexual citizens, and the book does contain descriptions of actual sexual assaults as students have experienced them. This material can be hard to listen to, and we all understand that, and we know that in every room, virtual or not, there are survivors. So what I want to do is I'll make sure that in the chat box we include um, a contact at Breaking the Silence at the University of Cambridge for anyone that would like to reach out to them. Um, please take care of yourselves and know please that you are not alone. So thank you so much, Jennifer and Seamus for joining us today. I know that it's very early where you are in the States. Um, I'm going to start with first uh, question. We're gonna have 45 minutes of in conversation discussion and then we'll move to 45 minutes of questions and answers from you in the audience. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and then I will look at those questions and read them out uh, for the latter 45 minutes or so. So can you tell us um, a little bit about the SHIFT study which I mentioned in the introduction and why you decided to write Sexual Citizens? Jennifer, perhaps you could kick us off. Sure. Um, and first, Charlotte and everyone, thank you so much for, for having us. We're delighted to be with you. And of course, we wish we could be with you in person. Hopefully that day will, will come again at some point. Um, so I'm going to open with a story and then um, broaden out to, to shift. Uh, so Austin, we interviewed him in uh, his third year uh, at university and he was in many ways a very sympathetic interview subject. He, the only, as you'll know, Charlotte, having read the book, the only really spicy sex scene in the book features Austin and his girlfriend on a hot summer night. And he was committed to being a good lover. He actually, he and his girlfriend had developed a series of nicknames for the different kinds of orgasms that she had. So he seemed like an appealing character, like the kind of person that you would want your son to be, or that you would want your son to go out with, or your daughter to go out with. Um, 
And yet in that same interview, he told us a troubling story. It was early in his freshman year, his first year he recounted, um, he'd been shuffled off into someone else's bedroom because his roommate wanted to be alone with his roommate's girlfriend. And so Austin was sent to sleep in some other bedroom where there was a girl in bed. He went into the room and she said to him, she was really drunk and she didn't want to do anything. And like that should give you pause, right? Why when someone you don't know very well comes into your bedroom, should you have to assert a sexual boundary? That should be obvious here in your bedroom, in your bed. And yet he, um, he didn't listen to her. Uh, he got in bed with her and uh, started to touch her body. And then he stopped himself, something stopped him. And um, so first he described that to us as a weird experience. And then later in the interview, we asked him what sexual assault was. And he said, well, I mean, he had gone to the same classes as all the other students at Columbia and Barnard. And he knew sexual assault is when you do something sexual with someone without their privilege, without their consent. And, um, and then he sort of paused and he became quite distraught. Um, and uh, that was the moment when you could see him realizing that he had sexually assaulted someone. Um, and so in sexual, we, we started the project out of which sexual citizens grew um, to change the conversation about campus sexual assault. Most of the focus has been on how we can improve adjudication, which is important, um, or on the idea that perpetrators are sociopaths and the campus is a hunting ground as if the only problem is broken people. And in Sexual Citizens, we describe how campuses are essentially a sexual assault machine situated in society, which produces sexual assault. So rather than thinking about broken people or broken institutional processes of adjudication, we focus on what we can all do to prevent sexual assault, the, the social roots of the problem. Um, and so SHIFT was a very large study funded by Columbia University that I, as you said, co-directed with Claude that had an ethnographic component, two survey research components, and then a, a policy and community engagement component. And sexual citizens grows out of that ethnographic component, which I co-led um, always to, to my delight uh, with Seamus. Oh, I and think Charlotte, Charlotte, we'll just we'll, we'll generally take turns, so you can just <clears throat> just direct the questions. We got. This. And I also think Joe that Charlotte can't unmute herself. There's something with the structure of the um, thing that we're that's not possible for us. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> the same Jamie thing happened missed. to me. So I was <laughs> I, I I had a degree of uh, um, <laughs> yeah understanding empathy maybe even. <laughs> okay, o over to you. <laughs> Um, so just very quickly to describe shift, um, uh, you know, or the, at least the research that um, sexual citizens was was built upon. Um, uh, the ethnographic portion of shift involved um, uh, over 150 interviews with students. These were two hours long where we talked to them about um, their experiences before university and then their experiences in university. And um, our approach was to make sense of people sort of broadly conceived. So we didn't study just sexual assault. In fact, um, I would say um, there were, I forget, I'm gonna get this wrong. I think there were 71 sexual assault instances in the interviews that we did. So it, it should make you more than half of the interviews did not have stories of sexual assault. And the reason for that is that while many approach um, you know, uh, sexual assault from the kind of activist call that rape is not sex. Um, and we would agree with that. We, we take the approach in the book that um, uh, sexual assaults emerge typically out of sexual conditions. Um, and so most assaults are consensual until they're not. Not all of them, but most of them. And so it's important to understand the organization of sexuality broadly conceived in order to make sense of sexual assault. And so in those interviews, we got a sense of people's personal histories, their histories with their families, with substances, with sex. Um, and we asked them to describe, you know, a good sexual experience, a typical sexual experience and a bad sexual experience. And we didn't use the word consent until after we had, had gathered information about their sexual experiences in order to sort of try not bias it too much. Um, <clears throat> In addition to those interviews, we ran focus groups, 17 focus groups, about 10 to 15 people in each one, 
um, uh, with both students in general and then students with particular kinds of groups like um, African-American students, first year students, religious students, um, LGBTQ students, to see how students talked about together um, sex and sexual experiences. And then finally, um, uh, what people say and what they do is not always the same. And so in addition to the um, uh, 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 focus groups and interviews, we um, uh, did a participant observation. And this meant Jennifer and I hanging out at public spaces on campus, like um, going to sporting events, dining halls, um, the areas that you would generally think of as public. And then we hired um, uh, a group of people who are younger than we are, um, uh, who could stay up late at night um, and uh, go to campus parties and things like that, but who could also integrate into more private spaces. And so then we have participant observation of fraternity parties, sorority socials, but also religious student organization events and just hanging out with students in the evening as they're cooking dinner together or you know, um, playing um, the, the board game Catan. And all together, this kind of serves as the data that, that make up um, sexual citizens. I'll say one final thing. I know I'm going on a little bit too long. We designed the study as also as a community-based participatory research model. And what that means is that um, we met every, but from the beginning, from we, before we even designed our first instrument until when we were well into analyzing our data, every Monday morning from eight till 10 in the morning, we met with uh, around 20 students who were not part of the research, but who served as a community board that served as kind of advisors to us and helped us get a sense of what campus love was like, you know, highlight things we should be paying attention to, but also give a kind of local knowledge to the ideas that we had. Um, and uh, that community-based search model was enormously helpful for helping us integrate into campus life. I mean, what I was really struck by was just the, the scope of the project. Um, I mean, you surveyed over 1600 students and there's also a daily diary that tracked students for 60 days, as well as I know you've identified the ethnography, focus groups and so forth. And, and even going to the different, you know, the different spaces in which they're living, sports events, like you say, fraternities and so forth, how comprehensive, I suppose. And, um, your study was and looking at these students as whole people rather than looking at the assault in isolation, I think is, you know, particularly remarkable in terms of this study. But what, what I really noticed was how the book was centered around three big ideas, um, sexual citizenship, sexual projects and sexual geographies. And that's, that's in my view, how you scope these three big ideas. Um, <clears throat> and there are the lenses through which you make sense of sexual assaults. These are the three uh, that, we've, that I've just identified. And Jennifer, I was interested to know from you, um, what actually is sexual citizenship? How do you define it? And how do you think it will help us understand uh, what happens in these types of cases? Um, so predictably, I'm gonna tell you another story. Um, Gwen was a, a tall, normatively beautiful white woman um, who was very excited to move to New York and slid easily into the club scene. She would, she wasn't interested in those, those, you know, schoolboys on campus. And so she would go out and um, meet sort of not very famous athletes or B-list actors, but to her, it felt thrilling and um, go back to their hotel rooms with them and this is not a story of assault, I just wanted to, to say up front. Um, go back to their hotel rooms with them. And she was very clear about her sexual boundaries. So um, at the end of the night, she said she would usually give them a blowjob to get out of there. And um, in the book, we also describe uh, two sexual assaults that, that Gwen experienced, but I just wanted to uh, stick for the moment on this one little vignette. So sexual citizenship lifts up the idea that people have the right to choose their own sexual experiences and that they need to understand that the other people around them also have that same right. So one of the things that we, um, we argue in sexual citizens is that part of the problem, not just of campus sexual assault, but of the ways that people can hurt each other when it's not illegal, but can still be harmful, um, 
is a lack of attention to other people's right to sexual self-determination. So those men who were expecting Charlotte to give them a blowjob late at night um, were had not been cultivated, had not been socialized to really think about whether she wanted to give them a blowjob or not. So they were very attentive to their own sexual citizenship as cis hetero men tend to be, um, particularly white cis hetero men, particularly white wealthy cis hetero men. And um, she had grown up in a world that uh, pushed her to think very much about men's right to sexual self-determination and to be unsure of her own right. So through the, pro through the experiences of assault that we describe in Sexual Citizens, she became much clearer about the fact that she didn't owe anyone a blowjob. And we argue in Sexual Citizens that we could do, we socially, not we two university professors, but we together could do a much better job of cultivating young people's sense of their own sexual citizenship and their understanding of other people's sexual citizenship so that people don't have to undergo multiple assaults in order to start to recognize their right to their own sexual boundaries. Mm, I think... I suppose it's you mentioned in the book how it's not only a failure in terms of um, him and his behavior rather than him being a bad individual and not recognizing her uh, need to exercise agency and autonomy and know what uh, whether she even wants to engage in this sexual activity with with him and allowing her that space to consider that but it's also a failure for her as well and not um, being able to exercise um, her agency in that particular context as well. So I, I think it's particularly important how in the book you identify that these are failures in terms of citizenship, but also behaviours rather than seeing individuals as inherently bad people because of their behaviours. Um, in Seamus, um, sexual projects, um, how, how does that help us understand what's happened? And also sexual geographies, how does that also help us make sense of what's happened in these scenarios? I, I mean, you know, the idea of sexual projects, what people are trying to accomplish with their sexual lives um, uh, ends up being incredibly useful. And the answer to that is that they're actually trying to accomplish a lot of different things. Um, and so the, the first thing it highlights is that um, uh, sex is not one thing, it's many different kinds of things. It's something that we pursue for pleasure. It's something that we pursue as part of status projects. It's something that we pursue um, in order to connect with loved ones or give comfort to them. It's something that we pursue for new kinds of experiences. We found that for LGBTQ students, sex was often a project of self-discovery, actually an understanding of who you were as a person. And so um, it helps us understand the multiple reasons that people are having sex. And one of the things that also helped highlight was that sexual assault itself was not one thing. It was actually many different things. And the challenge for us as communities in terms of addressing and reducing um, the rates of sexual assault in, in this approach that we take of a public health approach that thinks about prevention is that we typically think about preventing assaults in one way, rather than thinking about preventing them in terms of the multiple things that assault is. I'll tell just a quick story of charisma um, <clears throat> as a way to get to the idea of sexual geographies. And Jennifer and I tell stories through these talks all the time because we wanna give a feel for the book, which is very narratively driven and pretty close to data. So like, um, you know, you, you the conceptual apparatus is outlined in the beginning, but the, the book is, 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 I would say, very empirical. Um, uh, and Charisma was um, a Black and Latina student uh, who didn't really feel comfortable at, at Columbia and Barnard. And she described to us, you know, a, a, a social scene um, uh, dominated by white men who couldn't dance, drank too much, um, and didn't find her attractive. Oh, and they listened to shitty music. So she was sort of had this like view of campus life as just this place that was not very welcoming to her because the music that people listened to wasn't the music she liked, the way they danced wasn't the way she wanted to dance, and her physical body was not viewed as attractive to them. And so she told us a story of how, you know, early in her time at Columbia, she'd met this guy through her roommate and he lived way out in Brooklyn. And for those of you who don't know the geography of uh, New York, 
Um, Columbia is in Morningside Heights, which is the northern part of Manhattan. And to get to Brooklyn can be a little bit of a schlep. It's like, you know, especially on an evening, um, it may only be 10 miles away, but it could take well over an hour, maybe sometimes close to two hours to get to certain areas of Brooklyn. And she tells us this story of going there, the, the, tri the trip is sort of disastrous. She ends up finally meeting this guy in some ways miraculously. And then they're sitting together on his couch and he, you know, she is kind of interested in him. They're making out. And then he puts his hand somewhere where she's not comfortable. She moves it away and um, he does it again. And uh, um, uh, at that point in time, she said to us, you know, I just, I never had a plan B. My plan was always to just use body language and it had always worked before. And in this story, um, you know, the classic way to understand this experience would be um, men's sexual entitlement and um, uh, his um, complete ambivalence to her. And that's a good reading of that story, just to be very clear. Um, and and in, in terms of her sexual citizenship, it would be his denial of her sexual citizenship. But I think that there are other ways that we can also layer onto that interpretation. Um, the first is to think about campus as a racialized space and how that campus as a racialized space exposed her to a considerable amount of risk in ways that it wouldn't other students. Um, the second is to think about the geography of campus and the fact that she was suddenly in his space mattered. And so we draw upon you know, decades of social science research that talks about the importance of space for social interaction or thinking about how space matters. It's not just a backdrop, it actually produces experiences and being in somebody else's space truly mattered. The fact that white men controlled the social space of campus life had a significant impact on her experience. And so we can't think about that experience without an, a spatial analysis um, as well. The final thing I'll say is that her sexual project um, lacked a lot of clarity. And um, this was something that we consistently saw with students. We saw particularly with women um, uh, um, and with LGBTQ students whose sexuality in their own experience growing up had consistently been denied. So um, uh, their, the legitimacy of their sexuality was something that was denied by the communities that they, they, they came from. And that also put them at risk. On, this, on the point about sexuality being denied, um, in many ways that also relates to prevention of sexual assault. And you can see how it's two ends of the same coin and not being able to understand and express your sexuality at being denied, even repressed. And then at the same end, well, how do you prevent sexual assault? You even, haven't even had the education in the first place to fully express and understand who you are as a sexual being. And in this book, you do discuss sexual education, of course, as being necessary for preventing sexual assaults. I mean, it's, it's arguable really to argue anything other than that, perhaps. But can you talk more about what you learned about the importance of sex education through your study? And Shane, as I'd be particularly interested to understand whether you think, uh, from having read the book, that sex education should be mandatory. And if it was mandatory, what that might look like. Jennifer, maybe I'll let you jump in on this one and then I'll, yeah. Yeah, so I think you'll get both of us on this question. Okay. So, um, and this, I think, illustrates some of the value of this gigantic mixed methods um, project. One of the papers from the survey, a uh, paper led by my husband, John Santelli, so always got to name check him, um, which was published in PLAS, uh, showed that young women who'd had sex education before college that included um, skills building and how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence only sex education, it's just sex education that includes a skills development component, which as we know is part, sort of basic part of, of good education. Um, they were half as likely to be raped in college. <clears throat> I don't need to tell you that's a big effect size um, beyond what we usually get in, in social science analyses. And so that um, resonates uh, strongly with something that we found in the interviews, which is that um, for with the, I guess the, the obverse, which is that so many young people had grown up in an environment of silence and shame around sexuality where the only message they got from their parents was not under my roof. And it, it doesn't prepare young people to transition to becoming sexually active if the only 
message that they get is that they should never do it, right? Because they're going to do it at some point. We, a metaphor that we use a lot in the book and in these conversations is driving. Um, we acknowledge, at least in the United States, we, we acknowledge that driving is frequently a normal and reasonable part of the transition to adulthood. And so there are many structures in place to enable young people to do what is a pretty dangerous thing, right? To get in and move around a two-ton vehicle to get to accomplish their desires, to get where they want to get without hurting other people. Um, and it's not just yakking at them to not crash, right? They actually have supervised driving lessons. Not that we're suggesting anyone have supervised sex lessons, but they, they have. there's supervised driving and there's car design and there's road design. And there's sort of, a, there's been a complicated multi-level policy response to the danger of young people's driving that has actually made it safer. And we see a total absence of a parallel. It's as if um, what the message that we give young people, as if it were letting them grab the keys when they're drunk and just sort of looking over your shoulder and saying, well, I hope that works out for them. So that has been pretty much the adult and the policy response to young people's sexuality. And so we, we are accountable, right? We have produced an environment in which young people don't know how to do any better. And so they're likely to do much worse. Seamus, over to you. No, I think that's great. I think maybe we can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you also speak as well about sex education and how it's erased LGBTQ students um, and, and their feelings, particularly about sex education. Um, could you say a little bit about that and perhaps how a sex education could be more inclusive to make sure that everyone's experiences are understood and reflected? I mean, absolutely. Here in the United States, um, you know, with our kind of federal system, um, states have an enormous amount of power over what can happen within their boundaries. And so um, there are currently nine states in the U.S. that mandate um, uh, that sex ed be homophobic or, or that it not mention any experiences of LGBTQ students and that or people. And that is enormously harmful. We spoke to a young, young man named Adam um, who um, grew up in a fairly conservative Christian household in the Midwest and um, was very excited to go to New York, to go to Columbia because he sort of had this like vision that it would be a gay Mecca for him, uh, a place where he could be free of um, the oppressive cultural and family context that he came from. Um, but when he arrived at New York, he didn't quite find it to be as revelatory as he was hoping, um, in part because, you know, his family still had a pretty significant impact on his orientation to sex and sexuality. And he really wanted to be in a relationship. He wasn't that interested in just hooking up. And, um, you know, he, he described like meeting men on Grindr and, you know, they'd say that they were super interested in hanging out with him. And then they would just like, you know, they would do something sexual and then they would ghost him, like never talk to him again. And um, eventually he found a boyfriend and he was super excited about his boyfriend and um, um, was really happy about his relationship, except um, Adam told us that his boyfriend was really forceful about sex. And he described a, an evening where um, maybe not atypical, his boyfriend came home to the room pretty drunk. And in Adam's words, he basically raped me. And Adam refused to use the word rape um, to actually describe what had happened. And um, he described his reticence around this because he really liked his boyfriend. He really liked being in a relationship with him. He didn't want to be like on the market again. And he didn't want to talk to his friends about it because he didn't want his friends to hate his boyfriend. Now, that's a very long story that, you know, is somewhat tragic, but cannot be understood independent of the denial of Adam's sexuality by his family, the denial of an education in his sexuality by the community that raised him. And when Jennifer and I speak about comprehensive age appropriate sex sexuality education, it is not to speak about this as just an education in the mechanics of sex or the biology of bodies. Um, and that tends to be the focus in a lot of sexuality education. And, and like, look, biology is important, but you know, there's sort of this fascination of, of, or there's been this push, at least here in the United States to move away from any like relationship orientation with sex ed and to talk about like 
ovaries and the relationships to fallopian tubes and how the egg travels from the ovaries through the fallopian tubes into the uterus. And like, look, I'm all for education of people, but as it turns out, that's not super important for understanding sex. Um, it's sort of like, you know, to continue with the driving analogy, as Jennifer said, like basically, um, it's sort of like teaching people to drive by telling them how spark plugs work. And like, you don't actually need to know that in order to be able to drive a vehicle. And so what we suggest is a sexuality education um, that in, is LGBTQ inclusive so that those young people don't experience harm, but that also connects the discussions of sex with the broader moral lessons of what it is to be a person in the world and a good person in the world. And so, you know, from our perspective, like, you know, the, the, the language of morality and sex has in some ways been abandoned to the right. Um, and uh, we want to reclaim some of that because we think that there's real benefit to thinking about respect and recognition um, uh, of, of people uh, in, in this fundamental way, which centers equality in the discussion of sex and sexuality um, as part of the broader lessons of what it means to be a sexual citizen. Mm, well, I, I think you make a really compelling case for trying to understand further what it means to be a sexual citizen. And, you know, it strikes me that kind of um, really looking at sex education and what the different components are of it and how it's executed in different contexts and educational provisions really shows the deep gaping holes in that. And you make a compelling point in the book as well about how much money and time is invested in um, other forms of education and in work and in training. Um, and yet this vital part of frankly everybody's existence and relationship and even identities is about sexuality education, sex education, relationships, warmth, love, understanding, compassion. And um, you know that's a holistic um, educational uh, provision which quite clearly is is um, lacked in the US but not only there also in the UK and I know now there's more of a drive towards emotional intelligence and education and understanding but again it seems lacking in terms of its understanding of sex and sexuality so I, I really love that point in your book and how you've drawn that out so thank you um, in the book um, along with many other stories, now again, I like how it's very narrative based and there's an awful lot of evidence and sharing these studies really helps illustrate the points that you're making um, with evidence. But in the book, you tell the story of a young man who realizes as he's talking to you um, that he had committed an assault. And along with the need uh, for sex education, this story and others in the book, I think, show the need for conversations about restorative and transformative justice. And I know certainly in the UK and even in CEDAW, it's quite a controversial and in some respects suggestion, this idea of any form of mediation or uh, restorative justice and communication in context of sexual assault um, is sometimes seen as potentially causing more harm. So I think that's yeah, a highly interesting concept. And you also, uh, I think also take into consideration the calls to defund and abolish the police gaining recent mainstream attention, which we've all seen. Um, can you speak more to these ideas and how we as a society should consider shaping sexual citizenship with a new set of values? Um, Jennifer, do, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, so I think that we point to attention, we're certainly not the first to acknowledge this, between um, the abolitionist move in relation to mass incarceration and, you know, what people think of as carceral feminism. And I think that there has been um, the, the response, certainly there are problems with adjudication. So we don't want to say, say they're not, and neither of us are lawyers. So we really want to stay in our lane as social scientists and just point out that this is not a problem that we can punish our way out of, right? If you think about the very minute proportion of assaults that are reported, people have good reasons as we describe in the book or as Seamus even lifted up in, in Adam's story, people have very good reasons for not wanting to go through a formal system of reporting. And yet there is a real need for people who are hurting each other to learn that they are hurting each other and to be taught to do better. And so I, I, what we do is um, gesture towards the need for more work in that area 
without, I think, really diving deep into it because it's not our area of expertise. Um, I think I was circling back to what really is our area of expertise and one of the central contributions in the book that we haven't uh, really gotten to yet is how we take on the question of power, which is, I think, as social scientists, all of us in this conversation, that is our lane, right, to think about the social organization of power. So much of um, the early work important work on sexual assault and sexual violence focused only on gender. And even in the policy framing of sort of gender-based misconduct or gender-based violence or violence against women, it assumes that gender is the only important form of social power. And in Sexual Citizens, we build on and advance that by looking at the complexity of multiple forms of power. So when a young woman is assaulted by a, a fourth year student and she's in his room and he's got not just three years on her, but maybe five inches and 40 pounds. And he's in a building surrounded by his friends and he has much more sexual experience than she does and is less intoxicated. Those are all sorts of um, momentary forms of social power that put that man in an environment where he is potentially gonna assault somebody without even knowing it, right? Because of the power imbalance. And then in combination with those situational forms of power, there are the social power inequality. So think about charisma and the racialized way in which she felt ejected from campus. So it, we weave together um, gender with race and economic inequality um, and the social oppression of people in minoritized sexualities, so sexual and gender minorities, um, to, to articulate how all of those forms of power produce a landscape in which uh, sexual assault is likely to happen. And I would say a policy take home of that um, which I always feel like is important to lift up since we talked about um, sexual assault as a strategy for, um, for, pe for people keeping themselves from being assaulted. The corollary of that argument about power is that we need to do more to teach young people who have more social power not to deploy it in ways that hurt other people. So, because really our job should be teaching people not to rape each other, right? Not teaching people not to be raped. And so I think that sensitizing students on campus who do have more power to the ways in which that power can be silencing to somebody, um, can render them literally unable to do more than say no once, which makes it an assault, um, is an important part of our work going forward. Mm. Seamus, are you optimistic about a restorative justice framework? I appreciate the focus on repairing the harm rather than punishing the offender, but maybe in some cases, particularly if the offender is a repeat offender, do you think punishment could be justified? Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, first, Charlotte, as a barrister, you probably have a lot more uh, <laughs> insight into this um, than we do. We, we kind of offer up at the end of the book an idea of a restorative justice framework, and it's um, you know, we sort of say it, it pretty provisionally because also it, at this point, restorative justice is really a, like a conceptual approach. I don't think we have a, a really strong evidential base um, for its value. And as you point out, um, Charlotte, there are different kinds of assaults. I mean, um, in the survey, we found um, the survey that, that Claude Mellon's led, you know, we found that a non-trivial portion of assaults involve physical violence, right? So, um, and in instances where there's physical force, I think we're having a very different discussion than we are in other instances. And so, um, and I think it's important to note sort of methodologically some of the implications of our study, which is that, you know, we were always public about what we were doing. When we interviewed people, they knew that it was gonna be an interview about sexual violence. And I don't think someone who was purposefully causing harm to others would have ever stepped into a room with us. And so there's a selection effect into what it is that we saw. And that selection effect is that we probably saw the milder forms um, of sexual assault. And, um, you know, we did have some fairly harrowing stories that we heard from victims. Um, but uh, I, I think if we return to the idea that sexual assault isn't one thing, it's many different things. 
that sort of points to why it is that we propose, you know, a kind of broader framework of response, um, which I think does not close the opportunity for, you know, actually punitive responses in cases where punitive responses are necessary, particularly under conditions of repeat offenses or um, um, particularly violent or abusive. I mean, I think um, uh, you, we can have, uh, you can have violence without physical abuse, but um, uh, experiences. And so the, the hope with the restorative justice framework is, is maybe the restorative justice framework doesn't work. And for those who are listening along and who don't, aren't as clear about restorative justice, you know, it seeks to have a vis, vis, victim-centered approach um, that isn't by design oppositional, that requires that the person who's committed the harm acknowledge the harm. And then um, uh, uh, that it provides a model for reintegration into and remaking the community whole. And so that both means articulating that for the victim, but also for the person who committed the harm. And so it tends to have these sort of three planks to it, victim-centered acknowledgement of harm. And then um, it doesn't have to be reconciliation, but how it is it that you reconstitute the community? We think that in many instances that could be effective um, in part because, you know, fewer than 5% of assaults are ever reported um, in college and university settings. And we're trying to think about addressing those ones that are, are sort of happening, but not being addressed. And I think one of the things that Jennifer and I kind of, I, I don't know, Jennifer, if you appreciated it at the beginning, I certainly didn't, was the a level of co community level mental health burden that was being experienced across the campus. So, um, you know, we found that by the time they graduate, uh, women, um, about one in three would have experienced an assault. And for men, um, around 17, 18% of, of men, so about one in six uh, men would experience assault. And most of them talk to somebody about it. Most of them tell someone, they just don't tell an official. Um, and what we heard were stories where, you know, one woman told us about how she approached her friends about an assault that she'd had. And her friend told her a much more brutal story of being raped. And at that point in time, she realized in her words that, her, that my friends were just quote, too tapped out to be able to carry the emotional burden of my own. And I decided to just keep it to myself. And I think that that community level burden is something that we as people who are in leadership positions at these institutions should think about as something that we could be helping alleviate. Um, that students are carrying a lot for one another and it might be part of our responsibility in our mandate to think about not just the experience of victims but what this is doing at a community level and how, you know, counseling, like hiring more counselors is not the answer. I mean, it, it could be helpful, um, but the kind of environmental change that, that Jennifer and I are pointing to would require something much more. Um, I know we have a question specifically on that topic, which I'll, I'll come to in the question and answers point, but I think it, is, it raises an awful lot of questions, I think, about even where the legal punishment or you know, sentenced into prison, even works, has the desired effect of changing attitudes, beliefs and behaviours, even if it were to get to that stage. And I suppose what the most effective way is of um, ensuring that the victim as such has justice in whatever way that might work for that particular individual, whether it is restorative and uh, for the individual who has uh, performed that uh, violent or um, assaulting act, um, making sure that they don't reoffend in the future, making sure that that's really the aim of um, any work in, in this particular arena to reduce recidivism rate and uh, prevent, hopefully have a community and society where this doesn't take place. But before we come to question answers, I just wanted to touch on a theme that Jennifer spoke about, uh, and that was power. And power, of course, we know as sociologists is everywhere, but power in particular um, yeah, has a role to play in sexual assault. Can you speak um, to what you're able to reveal about the way race, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, other social identities and, and intersectional inequalities as well influence the likelihood of sexual assault and how youth with marginalized identities in particular experience power 
and sexual citizenship differently. So I suspect their experiences of sexual assault are different because of those inequalities. Jennifer. Um, so that's a big question and not one I'm sure I can fully answer um, in just a couple of minutes. So I'll take one part of it, which is the race part. Um, we found that every single woman that we spoke with, every single black woman um, had experienced unwanted non-consensual sexual touching. I just wanna say that again, every single one. And so um, a session on consent when students come into university is not gonna effectively present, pre prevent that because that's not just about sexual assault, it's about racism, right? It's about the systematically socially produced disregard for black women's physical self-determination. And um, so, so that's one sort of uh, data point in terms of the intersection between sexual assault and, and race. And another is um, Carl's story. Carl, um, uh, was very clear that he never had sex with women with women when they were drunk because as a black man that felt too dangerous to him. That was a practice, as we describe in the book, it is a practice in some ways of of white privilege. Um, and so there was a woman that he was uh, was interested in him one night at a party. He thought she was too drunk, and so as we describe, he he waited and he walked around with her. And finally, you know, in the early, early hours of the morning, she seemed to him not, not too drunk to have sex. And though they were back at his apartment, they had sex. And then as she was leaving, he recorded her saying that she'd had a good time because he felt so vulnerable that he actually had looked up in advance the New York state standards for evidence. And he knew that a recording that he had made secretly would be admissible as evidence in court if she ever accused him of assault. So that I think indicates the precarity that black men face. And that's just that's not just a re reflection of a Columbia campus, that's a reflection of the social history of America, right? You, you can't think about assault without thinking about our founding sin. And so um, we, in the book, we, we show how race is interwoven with the production of assault, but not there's not like a separate chapter on race and a separate chapter on queer students and a separate chapter on um, women's assaults because it's all intertwined in the way that people actually live power as a sort of intertwined part of the fabric of their daily lives. So um, I don't know, Seamus, you wanna pick up and talk a little bit more about queer students? Yeah, I mean, I think just briefly, I, I think, um, you know, as we've said, Jennifer and I build upon generations of research on gender and power, which we don't disagree with. We think is very valuable as a, as a perspective, but as we've said, you know, gender is not the only form of power. And if we think about assault as being intertwined with power relations, then an analysis, a systematic analysis of the multiple forms of power within a community becomes necessary and an intersectional framework becomes necessary. So as Jennifer noted, you know, among uh, the black women, that experience is an experience of race and power. And the power framework that feminist scholars developed is incredibly useful for understanding um, um, that experience, but we can't think about it as just gender-based violence. It's a, it's a form of racialized violence. And you know, for queer students, the continual denial of their sexuality became sort of really important for understanding um, uh, their experience. So I told the story of Adam already, but um, we also spoke to gender queer students who um, whose experience of their own sexuality was also was something frequently that was very challenging for them even to make sense of themselves and that their partners were frequently hostile to. And so um, uh, one person called them Maddie in the book, they use they, them pronouns, um, described how uh, they were transitioning from um, uh, uh, their uh, gender assignment at birth, which was male into um, a queer identity. Um, and as part of this, they didn't want to use their penis for sex. And they described how their partner forced them um, in part through just continual badgering um, to do this. And uh, um, you know, 
Mandy described it as a war of attrition. It was just a war of attrition in the relationship. And I think that this experience of Maddie's who was assaulted by another queer person um, can't really be made sense of independent of a, just a broad and systematic denial of queer identities and how um, uh, even understanding the legitimacy of queer desire became difficult. Um, and that um, what Maddie's partner said to them at one point was like, you don't think I'm beautiful um, as part of this uh, 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 sort of badgering. And Maddie sort of knew what it meant to be going through a kind of questioning of one's sexuality and gender identity, how it felt to, to feel like you weren't beautiful or weren't even you know um, deserving of sexual intimacy. And so that experience, and actually the broadly the experience of queer students who have the highest rate of sexual assault um, with, is within the LGBTQ community points to forms of homophobia or points to other power relationships beyond gender. Um, and so the chapter that where we write about this is entitled Gender and Beyond. Um, we purposely didn't wanna say beyond gender, um, but this particular story of Maddie points to things beyond gender that are essential for understanding why assaults happen. And it, it highlights our general, our, our overall take home, which is that the strategy, one of the strategies for addressing sexual assault is equality. That, um, that equality broadly conceived is a sexual assault prevention strategy. And that means being deeply committed to gender equality, but it means also that we don't stop at gender equality, that we think about racial equality and um, that that experience of Carl's that Jennifer just described requires a racial analysis and an understanding of black men's experiences with policing in the United States and how that is a challenge. It also points to how toxic masculinity and rape culture are good explanations, but totally insufficient to understand the entirety of the experience of assault. It's difficult to make sense of why it is that LGBTQ people have the highest rate of assault if your only framework is toxic masculinity. And again, for clarity, Jennifer and I are denying the toxicity of masculinity, but we are saying that as an analysis, it can be insufficient for totally understanding what is happening. Yeah, as you say, I mean, intersectionality is everything uh, and understanding sexual assault and on campus and beyond. Um, I'm going to move on to the questions. Um, the first question that we have is around the politics of the funding of your project. Uh, you said it was funded by Columbia University. Um, this person says, I would be interested um, to know whether there had been any resistance to your study. How were the findings received? What was the response of the university uh, to your findings? And did they act on any of your recommendations? Um, so this, the story of the broader SHIFT project, um, one thing it certainly does, it points to the importance of um, highly placed uh, feminist leadership in advancing institutional change. Um, Columbia doesn't typically give several million dollars to faculty who say they have a research idea. Um, but I sidled up to Suzanne Goldberg, who was the executive vice president for university life when she was presenting, she's an attorney. Um, she actually was recently named to the Biden-Harris administration's Department of Education. Um, so she was, um, managing uh, the university's uh, sexual violence prevention and response uh, initiative. And I said to her, I have an idea for some research, um, seeing that all the attention was to improving adjudication. And I thought, this is, this is the thing I know most about, is the social production of sexual behavior. And if we understood the social roots of this problem, we could transform prevention. And she was like, oh, very interesting. And um, one thing led to another. And so Claude and I led this sort of moonshot level research project under um, pretty perfect circumstances. We had a lot of money. We had an incredible research environment in terms of wonderful colleagues like Seamus, and there were actually eight faculty members involved in the broader shift project. Um, it was a team in total of 30 people. And so we had a lot of resources, an incredible research environment, 
total scientific independence. So at no point, at zero point, was there ever any interference from the university. They basically said, here's a bag of money. Let us know how we can help you. Let us know what you find. Um, and then a, a sort of a grounding principle, which Seamus referred to earlier, we know that most research has no effect on the world, right? People just like churn out knowledge and then it gets ignored by policymakers. And the stakes felt too high and our obligation too substantial to just hand the university a binder of recommendations at the end, which we knew would then get shelved with every other binder of recommendations they'd ever received about racial justice or sexual violence or disability inclusion or anything. And so instead from the beginning, we set out to work in dialogue with both administrators and students. And so with students, it involved having this wonderful group of undergraduates meet with us every week, um, <clears throat> as Seamus noted, to advise us. And with administrators, um, the, any of you who've done the sociology of policy will know this, that, that what makes research findings stick is when you have bi-directional dialogue from the beginning. And so it was never about us telling them you should do this or you should do that, but rather sharing with them what we were finding. And I think the most, one of the most compelling examples of the impact that our work had um, on the Columbia campus was that <clears throat> the person, the, the um, senior administrator who's responsible for um, housing and dining. So sort of the whole physical material texture of the undergraduate experience. Um, he was on our advisory council and he had never seen himself as part of sexual violence prevention. He just thought he was responsible for like the furniture and the menus, right? Keeping the carpets clean. And in conversation with him, he, he began to see how the physical environment that students live in is part of the sexual geography and therefore part of the social production of assault and so made the decision to actually use campus space resources in different ways. For example, one of the dining halls, um, Scott Wright decided to keep it open all night so that students at four in the morning when the bars closed down and the parties are over would have someplace else to go. And not with the idea that like a plate of greasy chips is going to prevent all assaults, but it just, it changes the environment. It provides another opportunity, another place for people to be if they don't necessarily want to move into a sexual setting. Remembering that when students go back to a, a dorm room, there are only four pieces of furniture, a desk, a dresser, a desk, a desk chair and a bed. And so students end up sitting on the bed. And so Scott in his power over the whole campus environment created another place that they could sit. Um, so Columbia was um, terrific, both enormously courageous, um, very generous um, in, in uh, supporting the work, in trusting us to do the work, in not getting in our way while we were doing it. Um, and then in being uh, responsive to, to being willing to be in conversation with us about what we were finding. We would love other universities. Um, this is a little bit of a throw down to Cambridge. So I think that, you know, the, the optic that we offer through sexual citizens with sexual geographies and sexual projects and sexual citizens is a, is a framework that other campuses could use, but certainly the geography of, uh, sex of sex and sexual assault will look different. At, at different institutions of higher mm. education. And so pick up our framework and um, let us know what you find. So that we're wrong. <laughs> no, that's, that's a nice call out to the University of Cambridge. <laughs> uh, it's certainly, we need it. Um, and you know, as you say, it's a framework that could potentially be rolled out to other universities, whether in the US or in the UK. And if you do, perhaps you could come back and talk to us about that in the future. Uh, we have another question. I would love to hear more about how the team combined a public health and a sociology perspective on sexual violence in their work and whether there were more differences, whether there were some differences between the two that had to be reconciled or accommodated within the project. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this was, I think there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinary research um, and it, I'm not sure it always works out very well. And, and Jennifer and I, you know, Jennifer is um, trained as an anthropologist uh, and uh, I'm uh, trained as a sociologist and we're pretty closely aligned um, in, the, in the writing of this, um, which was, is an experience we could definitely talk about the analysis and the writing um, because it was challenging. We were pretty closely aligned, but you know, on the, the main executive team of this, there was um, Claude, who's a clinical psychologist, 
uh, Patrick Wilson, who's also a psychologist, um, Jennifer's uh, husband, John, who um, is uh, uh, an MD, uh, in addition to other things, <laughs> um, and uh, um, biostatistician. And so coming together to try and get a shared sense of what we should be doing was not easy. Um, it was, you know, the, the um, you know, some tensions in the survey were about, um, you know, the, in the psychology literature, they really want to use validated measures, measures of phenomenon that have been used again and again and again and shown to be valid across a range of contexts so that we could compare our results to other kinds of results. And then Jennifer and I would come in and be like, but that's not a good way to ask a question. Like, why would you ask the question that way? It, it's really, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't make that much sense. And so, and then, you know, there would be this back and forth um, about how that might be adjusted. And they would look at what we were doing and be like, well, how can you say, how can you call what you just heard about an assault? The person doesn't describe it as an assault. And then one of these surprising things over the course of the qualitative research was that um, many people who experienced assault did not describe it or even subjectively think about it in those ways. So we told the story of Adam who didn't experience, uh, he said he basically raped me, but was very adamant that it wasn't actually an assault. And um, um, we had many more stories from women who described having sex in their terms uh, where they said no, sometimes repeatedly and the sex continued, but they described it as having sex and did not think about it as an assault and made justifications for why it wasn't an assault. And so, you know, the, the quantitative people were like, how are you categorizing that as an assault? Um, and, you know, we would have to get into a discussion of how it met an operational definition and people's subjective meanings are important for us and we take them seriously. But when it comes to the analysis of categories, if it meets the operational definition of non-consensual sex, it still counts as an assault. So, you know, what it required was, I think, a certain degree of patience, um, an enormous amount of meetings. And it's hard to just, I mean, in the methodological appendix, we outline the amount of meetings that we had, but Jennifer and I would meet for two hours every Monday with the um, advisory board. We would then meet on Tuesday, two hours together to go over the field notes and interview notes from others. Jennifer and Claude, and then sometimes me would meet on Wednesdays for two hours. We would then meet with the, the research team who are gathering some of the data for two hours on Thursday. I mean, we were at a minimum in meetings together, I would say eight hours a week for 18 months um, and frequently more than that. And if we weren't meeting, we were on the phone. Um, and so I think that the constant contact, the respect for one another and the intellectual approaches um, was really helpful. In terms of combining public health and sociology, which was actually the question, um, the approaches aren't terribly far from one another. Um, the Bronfenbrenner ecological model that is centered within public health is basically within anthropology and sociology, the micro macro discussion about how it is that you tie micro level analysis to macro level processes, what counts as observations there. And so I think being a little intellectually flexible, having respect for other people's disciplinary approaches where you think like, it's not that they're stupid because they ask questions that way, they have really good reasons for doing so. And all research is a compromise. All research, no, like research questions are never gonna be perfect. Um, and then I think uh, I'll finally say that respect was also grounded in coming to the research process as whole people, um, you know, where we shared a lot about ourselves um, and had a kind of humanistic approach to what we hope was a very, very kind of scientifically grounded research experience. And that humanistic approach helped us, I think, have also empathy and understanding for one another, not just our research subjects. Yeah, I think the humanistic approach really came out strongly in the book. And you say about the need to have compassion for each other and those that are interviewed as well. Um, and I, I, thinking about the sociology and public health angle, the next question touches on the law. And I know that this is not 
a book about adjudication and for those who are listening it, it's certainly not that and perhaps you can speak a bit to why that is understandably so given the topic of the book um, but this question says my work is about the imprisonment of men convicted of sexual offences and in particular what prisons morally communicate to men about their offending I have found that legal punishment very rarely persuades people that what they have done is in sexual assault slash rape, which is exactly what you've uh, really identified, not only in terms of what people have done, uh, but what people have experienced as well. And if anything encourages denial, can you talk a bit more about what happened to perpetrators? And I know you don't use that word perpetrators in your book. Um, can you talk about what happened to perpetrators in your study when they recognized or were told what they had done? Relatedly, what happened to victims when they named or had named what had happened to them? Um, so I think first it's important to circle back to what Seamus said um, a moment ago when he noticed the, the sampling bias that was built into our work. So people who intentionally and deliberately harm others were unlikely to sail into the interview room to tell their story. Um, and so the subset of people that we got who committed assault either had realized it in the past and were anguished by it, and that's why they came in to tell their story, or in some cases told their story and in the telling, as I recounted with Austin, realized it, or sometimes never realized. So they came in to share a story with us, and they sh and, but not thinking of themselves as an assaulter, and they left still not thinking of themselves as an assaulter. So there's not one way that people, I mean, I, as an anthropologist, I will always go to particularity. And so there's not one way that people experience what they have done. I think that the, the way that the circulating discourse of um, perpetrators as terrible people shapes how people experience what they do is they cannot see themselves as that terrible person. So we're sort of in a quandary here because yes, assault is a very harmful thing to do. And yet, if we talk about it as a kind of person, then people will never see themselves as an assaulter, right? Mm -hmm. They will never see themselves as capable. And so we have to um, sort of thread the needle and talk about sexual assault as a harmful thing that regular people can do so that people can identify themselves in that behavior be, be accountable for it and learn to do better. Um, so the, the, I mean, I think in particular of one young woman who had assaulted her gay best friend early in her time at university and was, you, you know, they, they sort of started into banter and repartee and flirting and, and she then basically coerced him into, into um, penetrative intercourse. And, um, she was racked by it. And she came into the interview looking like a monk. She had shaven her head and, and, and she, had, she described herself as, as asexual, previously heterosexual, because she, was, she couldn't put herself back together as someone who um, had, should, be, should deserve to have sex and pleasure having done what she saw as, uh, and which was a, a um, a, a bad thing to have done. Um, and yet her friend, honestly, the way he responded to her mm -hmm. said that it, he was, did not feel that harmed. And so I think that there's not, um, there's not a way that people are gonna experience assault. And I guess the thing that I would uh, just um, point to is the, the ways in which the circulating discourse around the morality of sexual harm makes it hard for people to see themselves in it. And I'll just briefly, very, very briefly layer onto that. You know, um, Jennifer and I tend not to use the language of perpetrator. Instead, mm -hmm. we use the language of acts of perpetration. And um, what this question sort of highlights is that um, thinking about perpetrators as types of people, um, that is, it's fundamental to who you are, is different than thinking about perpetration as an act that people do. Um, and I think one of the challenges is the identity aspect of committing an assault where, um, and this is not just a challenge for the people who may have committed an assault. It's a challenge also for those who have experienced harm. So 
in the case of Adam, to describe his boyfriend as somebody who raped him makes his boyfriend a rapist or a perpetrator, makes him a kind of human being that commits <coughs> harm to others versus a human being who did something wrong. And you know, here, uh, some of the work of Khalil Muhammad here in the United States, who writes in The Condemnation of Blackness about how Black Americans were transformed from being people who committed crimes to criminals, right? And that that process, which social scientists were intimately involved in, in the 1920s in the United States, you know, it, it transformed the racial politics of America or helped maybe not transformed it, reinforced, I should say, the racial politics of America. And, you know, I think in the same way, you know, there are perpetrators out there. There are people who, you know, are committed to, 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 to doing harm. But for those who, you know, episodically do this, um, I think that the, the language of this as something that is a personality type versus an act can, can really have, you um, uh, uh, negative consequences because it's easy to think that sexual assault is because of bad people and then to all look around and be like, well, we're not bad people. So, you know, happily, it's not us. It's more difficult to realize that like people, you know, people you're close with, maybe even you have done this before and it was a bad thing to do. It doesn't necessarily make you a broken or bad person. But that what we wanna do in this is open up that space so that when we talk about perpetration, we recognize that maybe it was your brother or your uncle or father or you or your child or someone else in your life. And I used male there because the vast majority of assaults are committed by men. Mm, I mean, the media is partly responsible for this as well because it depicts those that have caused sexual harm as monsters, as outliers, rather than, as you say, somebody that walks in your household or is a member of your family or is a very close friend. Um, and given the prevalence rates um, of sexual assault and sexual harassment, um, it's, it's hard to be able to reconcile this kind of notion of someone being a monster and that an outlier versus, well, this happening in most people's um, lives. Um, moving on to the next question, you mentioned how important it is to think about situational organisations of power. And the example of a fourth year versus freshman was a clear example of this. How could some of the findings of your study bracket um, out to discussions of staff and student sexual assault, thinking about the power dynamics there? So, um, yes, I mean, the 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 example that, that Jennifer gave of the fourth year and first year also, I just wanna layer one thing onto that before fully responding, which is that it's not just that they have more power, it's often that institutions augment rather than moderate that power. And so um, there's a naturalization of certain sets of power inequalities on campus. So in the United States, in the fraternity and sorority system, for example, Fraternities are allowed to serve alcohol at events and sororities are not by national rule. And so what does that do? It gives men control over the distribution of alcohol and the control over party spaces on campus. And so I think it's important to note that that is an institutionalization of power inequalities or there's similarly a naturalization that more senior students get access to better space on campus. So like in your dormitory room, the more senior you are, the better your room is. And so what that effectively does is it shuttles young people into spaces controlled by old people or older people. They're only three years older maybe. And that is a formalization of inequality that gets augmented rather than moderated by institutional rules. And so I think thinking about that becomes super important. And you know, the spatial analysis that we give here in terms of sexual geographies is really important. You know, um, Jennifer, when she answers this question, uh, sometimes sa uh, said, I have seen my colleagues cry over the size of their office because space and status are so deeply intertwined among faculty. And you can think about this, the faculty who are listening along right now, like how important is it to you that your office be the size of the office of other people you consider to be status equivalents? And how, how like, you know, that sort of the material reality of that space 
reflects your symbolic status within the organization. And if you don't have the right kind of office with the right kind of view, with the right size, it is somehow a violation of your correct status position. And we want to see the spaces on campus reflect those power inequalities and actually build on them rather than moderate them. And so, you know, what this points to is how institutional design is central to explaining the things that we're observing. Now, in terms of extending this beyond the students, um, I think that there's an important analysis to be done there. Um, Jennifer and I, and in the broader shift team, we only looked at student to student interactions. In the survey, we asked people questions about unwanted sexual contact with graduate students among undergraduates and with faculty. Important to note that there were almost zero, I think it was zero observations of unwanted sexual contact with faculty. And this was repeated in other surveys that have been done. And so, you know, um, the, the guys have kind of gotten the memo, I think, um, that this is one of the ways that they can lose their jobs um, relative to tenure. And that would be, you know, Charlotte, to return to an earlier question, probably an effective punitive strategy to minimize the risks and harms that are experienced by undergraduates is that fairly punitive strategy that has had an effect on behavior. Um, but we limited our analysis to peer-to-peer -peer interactions among undergraduates. And so I think that the analysis could be extended to those other contexts to think about institutionalized power, how um, sets of rules protect those in more powerful positions that are non-peer relationships, but it's not an analysis that we did. And just one thing, this wasn't what you asked, Ali, but I just want to add on. Um, we also, as we were setting out to do the research, we faced a really important decision about um, honing in on our outcome variable for the ethnography. So we intentionally bracketed out not just um, uh, unwanted sexual uh, um, advances from, from faculty and staff, but also other kinds of gender-based misconduct. So we didn't look at stalking. We didn't, didn't look at um, anti-LGBTQ microaggression. So there's lots of discriminatory and harmful behavior among peers that we also didn't look at. Cause we, we had to go, we decided to go really deep on one outcome which is understanding uh, uh, sexual assault and in particular really focusing on, on rape um, as opposed to every possible outcome. So it's just a research design for those of you who are thinking about that, which I assume is all of you. Um, next question is, your discussion of the interconnecting power elements to sexual assault got me thinking about the power and privilege associated with Columbia. Do you think the prestige and elite, elite nature of Columbia and other elite universities has an impact on sexual assault and its dynamics on campus? Were particular aspects to Columbia and its campus culture discussed? Um, this is a question that we're very interested in, and yet one that our research design really doesn't allow us to answer, because even as in some ways the most interesting thing to us is how the environment produces um, assault, if you're only working in one context, there's no variation in the environment. And so, um, it, it, you know, we're, we're interested in building on the work that we did um, to think about cross-campus comparisons, but we can't speak specifically to how the Columbia environment might be different than other environments. And yet, I mean, it was, there were certain characteristics, um, the sort of self-conscious articulation of the Columbia environment that students um, could speak immediately to. So the stress culture, the sort of valorization of working all night and the intense focus on academic achievement clearly shaped students' sexual interactions. As one of the students on our advisory board told us, a relationship is like a four credit class. The idea being that there are opportunity costs to investing in sustained intimacy. So you're actually better off thinking about your long-term professional goals to just hook up with people and not get entangled emotionally. So there, were, there was a clear way in which we saw that the um, academic and um, professional aspirations of students did shape the context of intimacy, but obviously that would be more robust if we, if we had a cross-campus comparison, which we don't. And I think just it's important to note that, you know, we definitely did see a kind of um, 
uh, you know, power or privilege and versus precariousness in the results where, you know, um, those people who were in more precarious positions, be that LGBTQ students, students of color, or we haven't talked about class. Um, in the survey, um, one of the findings was that um, students who had difficulty paying for their basic needs were at higher risk of experiencing an assault. Mm -hmm. And this, this gave us a sense of like on the spectrum of power to precarity or precariousness, those people who were more precarious within the institution were at greater risk. And one of the things, you know, Columbia is a deep, deep like institution of privilege, but it's also a very diverse institution. Fewer than half of the students are white. Right, and so that increased diversity of the institution has also laid bare some of the inequalities that are not necessarily, you know, produced by Columbia, but actually exist in the society, and then are carried into that space where we see these people interact. And so, you know, um, I think that's important. And then I just want to add one additional thing to this, um, and it's not from our research, but it's from research on sexual assault more broadly. Indications are that people who um, uh, are not in university are at greater risk of assault, women in particular, than women who are in university. And so there is something to power and privilege about assault, but so much of the research, particularly in the United States, has focused on the experiences of university women and the high rates that they experience. But you know, the studies that I think we would think of as, as pretty good suggest that the rates may be 20% higher for women who are not at university. And so as we begin to do this analysis of power and privilege, we cannot forget the corollary analysis of precarity and disadvantage and how the most disadvantaged women are not in university and they may be subject to the greatest harms and that that needs to be part of our you know, future analysis and work in this area. I'm going to come on now to the final question. Um, I would like to come back to the citizenship concept. Am I correct in my understanding that this concept is a metaphor which designates the membership in a sort of nation state of sexual practices, which implies certain rights and certain obligations? I'm wondering if you've considered the concept of sexual fields too. This is why we love giving academic talks. Um, what a great question. Um, I think I would tweak that formulation just a little bit because the way that we use sexual citizenship, we would say that it designates membership in a community of sexual practices because the idea, you know, if, if the problem with citizenship obviously is implying a nation state metaphor. The nation state has the power to exclude people. And um, so we're not imagining that there would be a bounded nation state in which some people are never permitted to enter, but rather we are together a sort of self-governing community of people who need, who have the obligation to cultivate uh, sexual citizenship with its rights and obligations in all of us. So sort of we are our own rulers of this, this um, nation state of sexual citizens. Um, uh, because, so anyway, I think that, that, that you, you, um, you identified the limit of the metaphor um, in, in pointing to that. And I, I actually am not familiar with the um, concept of sexual fields, but it sounds like it might be interesting. I don't know, Seamus. It, it you know, is, yeah, and, and I, I have a student who's writing a dissertation on sexual fields right now. And so it, it is, at least within our, my, um, the frame of reference, I would say that, um, you know, the academic papers that we wrote for this project are very academic. They're, they're, they're papers published in peer reviewed journals. The book is written for a general audience. And so I think that there are things that the, um, you know, that the academics on this call will find, you know, rewarding in the book conceptually. Uh, um, but, you know, um, and it's, you know, there's, 30 plus pages of footnotes and a very long methodological appendix where you will learn everything you need to know. So it's, you know, 400 plus page book of which 270 maybe are the text. And then, you know, we bring the receipts at the end um, for those of you who are academics. But Jennifer and I were very conscious that we wanted to be in conversation with a general public and we wanted to be in conversation with, um, you know, 
uh, people who were about to go away to university, the parents of people who were about to send people to university, and to be able to communicate with them um, in a kind of, in a, in a way that might compromise a little bit academically, we don't think too much, um, but that had sort of clarity for an everyday reader. And so, you know, there's a way that we could have described sexual citizenship as, as um, efficacy, right? And talked about self-efficacy and collective efficacy and how it's important to develop a sense of self-efficacy and how communities themselves are responsible for creating efficacious human beings. But like, it just wouldn't have been sensible to people who were reading outside of the scholarly context. It would have been very, you know, we, we could have spent a lot of time explaining it, but it's not part of the sort of parlance of, of everyday speech. And so there are certain elements of the book that are oriented to that. And, um, you know, there's a pretty thick uh, conceptual apparatus that's presented at the beginning, but then it's really narrative. I mean, it's just kind of story after story after story after story that seeks to eventually sort of give people the perspective um, that we're providing and the arguments about power and the complexities of power, they used to be kind of at the beginning of the book and now they're absolutely at the end so that you build this um, empirical base to help with that. But I think, you know, for, for the readers, it'll, it, it's, it was a very, um, I think, rewarding and valuable exercise in thinking about the dynamics of communication of scholars to broader communities and what it means to have research impact um, that could be possible through that kind of approach. Thank you so much. I'm going to draw um, this public seminar now to a close because we are out of time. Um, but I just wanna say a huge thanks to Professor Jennifer Hirsch and Professor Seamus Khan for coming to the Department of Sociology in Cambridge today virtually, uh, hopefully next time in person to discuss your book, Sexual Citizens, a Landmark Study of Sex, Power and Assault on a Campus, published by W.W. Norton. Um, please pre-order uh, the paperback book. Uh, it's out on the 26th of February in the UK. For those that have missed parts of the session or would like to catch it again, the session is being recorded and is available on the Sociology website. If you have any further questions, you can also contact us there. Is there anything else, uh, Jennifer or Seamus, you would like to say before we close the session? Thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you, Joe, for setting this all up. Thank you, Ellie, for inviting us. And we really appreciate, Charlotte in particular, you being our interlocutor for this. It was wonderful. Um, and I may follow up to ask you questions about your own experience working on these issues and 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 where you would push the book to, and us to think, um, to build. So, th but yeah. thank you all for being part of it. Well, thank you so much. And I can see that there's lots of thanks in the chat box and lots of what a fantastic and fascinating talk this was. And I can certainly echo that. And as someone who's read the book, I would highly recommend reading it for anyone that's interested in these issues. And as someone who's campaigned long for change in addressing more on the adjudication angle of sexual assault on campus. I think it provides a more nuanced perspective as to how sexual assault even starts to take place and the different factors and climate and space that allows that and how we can change it together collectively. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future.